Well, hello, Dave Phelps here from Garden Enlightenment. I gave a presentation to the North Coast chapter of CLCA a couple evenings ago to commemorate uh, our good friend, uh, Will Bax, as he uh, transitions on to a better and bigger things. And uh, I was asked to share the slide deck, so I thought I'd go ahead and record this uh, so that uh, other folks can see uh, what I put together. I don't really know Will that well. Um, I've probably only met him maybe 10 times, but every time I've got to hang out with him, usually in a teaching environment, um, it's been wonderful. He's, he was such a, a great guy and uh, always, you know, the hearty laugh, lots of humor, and yet this deep understanding of soils and compost from his, you know, decades and decades of work in that field. Um, so I was very honored to be able to give this presentation. And uh, why don't we go ahead and, and go through it so that uh, hopefully we can honor all the work that he's been, he has uh, taken on. So this is a tribute to Will Bax, a soil scientist, purveyor of fine compost, guru of soil fertility, and just a really great guy. Um, uh, moving forward here, I, I can remember many days of getting his resources, his products, and not really understanding the connection of the man behind the products. Uh, I was a big fan of Mallard Plus. Um, and understood the importance because I was doing Bay Friendly rated landscapes and I was doing other landscapes where we had to have organic compost. And a lot of the compost available was uh, they would use a different and inorganic nitrogen source like ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate, um, you know, to, to get that right mix of carbon to nitrogen for the decomposition process. And, uh, but Sonoma Compost and Will, he was out there uh, as a pioneer and using organic, um, mostly chicken based, uh, either chicken manure or feather meal to get that extra nitrogen boost for his composts. And I really appreciated that. Also, he was very consistent in getting his products tested so I could, you know, have that documentation uh, as backup for some of these landscape projects. But, you know, as I look into this, I'm realizing the, the work and the artistry that went into making such high quality, consistent products. He would go in there and get the proper size, um, you know, by breaking it down to that two and a quarter inch size initially and building out those windrows till they're seven feet high and turning them really consistently, um, but making sure they've got the proper moisture. I'll see if I can grab. There's a great video uh, available online of Will, you know, squeezing that compost and, and tapping it. He, he could tell just, you know, with his hands and his touch and his senses uh, what the moisture content was within about five percentage points, which is pretty amazing. Um, so keeping those um, windrows turned, getting... So let's talk a little bit about the moisture content. Um, optimum moisture content for composting is between 40 and 60 percent. In uh, the spring, we like to get the moisture content on the high side at the end of the rainy season, so that when it starts heating up, that uh, we have already reserve of moisture in there. When we come towards the rainy season, we want to get on the drier side so that the compost actually can absorb the rainfall that's coming in. Now, how do you tell what the moisture content is? Well, I take a little sample like this here. And you see me weaving through it. I want to make sure that nothing sharp punctures in my hand. And I squeeze this material hard. If I would see water running out between my fingers, I know that I'm over 60% moisture content. I open up my hand. If a ball remains and the ball is shiny, I'm between 55 and 60% moisture content. If there's a ball like this here and it's not shiny and I tap in it and the ball remains, 
that means I'm between 50 and 55 percent moisture content. If I would have tapped this here and the ball would have fallen apart, I'm between 45 and 50 percent. If I squeeze it and the ball would have never formed, I'm between 40 and 45 percent. Unless when I drop it and my hand would feel totally dry, I'm below 40 percent moisture content. At that point, I'm below optimum composting. Getting that moisture just right, managing the temperatures, getting it all tested, just huge and, and really appreciated. Um, I, in doing a little bit of research for this presentation, I found a, several different uh, articles, and one had a quote in it that really spoke to me. Um, this was by um, Wendy Krupnik. Uh, she said that the company's products were, quote, so much more uniformly, consistently superior to what the other co local companies are providing. And I think it's largely due to their attention to detail and really their commitment to production techniques. And, you know, realizing now that that was well in the background, just making sure everything was happening um, to, to get this right. I found a copy here of one of his... Um, this is a windrow turning chart, you know, and you can see uh, he's managing this and being extremely consistent. Um, and he's using the drip irrigation to keep that moisture content just perfect on those windrows, constantly going in and monitoring the temperatures to make sure that he's getting that heat at right at the to the right amount so that he's going to kill off any pathogens or weed seeds and then going the extra mile to get that material OMRI listed, registered with the organic input materials, a CDFA, and getting, you know, what is the NPK and what is the analysis? And, and that was just huge for me, trying to um, supply products for various sites and customers. So uh, he was also really, you know, kind of a, a pioneer and staying at the cutting edge of what was happening when he expanded his area there. Um, he made sure that they treated the soil and had the ponds down there at the low end so that he was protecting the local aquifers and uh, making sure that any rinsate or leachate that came off of this composting system wasn't going to interfere with our waterways um, or you know create uh, nutrient issues downstream, so to speak, because uh, we know that can lead to eutrophication and and uh, fisheries collapse and all of that. So uh, really nice that he was aware of those issues. He also, this is kind of, I didn't know this was the case, but in terms of protecting his neighbors, um, he was had a mist system going downwind of the composting areas, and he actually had enzymes within that mist that would um, essentially treat some of the odors coming off of there such that um, the neighborhood wouldn't have to deal with, um, you know, the odors that might come off of a, a major, um, huge, massive uh, composting facility. He was also uh, a leader um, in aerated static piles because he saw what was company coming in terms of the uh, regulations about using or having to compost more and more green waste and how he was going to have to um, go through more uh, green waste mass and produce more compost quicker. And the aerated static piles was going to be one way to do that rather than the windrow. So he was doing that. He was also making um, it... it it available to bring in green waste on uh, green material drop-off day days to help promote uh, folks that are were clearing their land and creating defensible space for fire safety and supporting school gardens, but also doing a lot of outreach. And that's where I saw him in terms of education and teaching. So some of the other things that I learned about uh, Wells. Will's career here is that he actually uh, did a couple of studies 
that I found just fascinating, and I know that they made a big impact on the industry. Um, one was a vineyard mulch study, where he actually went out and in, I believe it was four different vineyards, he laid down three inches of his vineyard mulch and then monitored it to uh, look at the leachates and was able to prove um, that, you know, that three inches of mulch really uh, reduced the erosion uh, and the sediment coming off of that land by, you know, 90% almost, you know, somewhere between 78 and 98%. Um, he then went on to add a second year of study onto that with top dressing with additional uh, mulch um, and, and came up with the idea that actually that didn't improve it all that much. But that initial three inches was huge and a game changer. The other research item that I found really fascinating, because uh, I remember back in the day when um, saw the, the sudden oak death was a really drastic issue, uh, especially in Marin when we were looking at our uh, lithocarpus, you know, just dying and all of our coast live oaks having such a hard time. As an arborist, I had to sign a lot of death warrants because folks weren't allowed to remove the trees unless an arborist signed off that they were dead. Uh, so that was really depressing. And, and if you remember, we were all the green waste that came from the oaks had to get shunted off to the side because no one was sure if the Phytophthora remorum could actually get you know, through the composting process. But Will worked with the Sudden Oak Death Mortality Task Force and the good folks at UC Berkeley to actually test and prove that, yes, indeed, the composting process does kill the Phytophthora. So um, that was a, a game changer for the composting industry. You know, um, in addition to being a pioneer on all of this, he was also a big proponent of practices and ideas that were not really your average soil concepts and, and methodologies. Um, and I'm, just a quick list here. Uh, I, I have access to oh, what, a couple, two of his uh, slide decks and I got online, I found two more. So just by going through these four slide decks and looking at what he was talking, it was interesting to see um, how his presentations progressed depending on who his target audience was and, and when um, the, the talk was going on. But organic nitrogen, which I mentioned, was a big one. He was a proponent of biochar as an amendment, uh, biodynamic preps, worm castings, oyster shell flower, um, mycorrhizae, and inoculants. Uh, inoculated wattles or compost socks for erosion control, no-till agriculture, and uh, of course sheet mulching. Um, you know, if, if you're going to be selling compost and mulch, you got to love sheet mulching because uh, that, that's perfect. So I'm just going to go through a few of these and um, uh, talk about some of the benefits. But it's really neat to know that Will was there on the leading edge, really uh, promoting these things. So with organic nitrogen sources, uh, where he had his compost facility, very convenient to be there next to Petaluma's chicken industry and have access to really high quality, uh, large amounts of uh, chicken manure, as well as some great uh, feather meal. And I think this is something that we as landscapers can look to and, and follow his lead such so that uh, we're not going to be using urea or ammonium sulfate or some of these fossil fuel, non-renewable nitrogen sources, but rather look to cover crops, legumes, right? Um, plant residues, manures, um, you know, he used chicken manure, but there's a lot of other manures available and meals. You know, uh, he was using feather meal in a lot of his blends to get that nitrogen kick. Um, but there's blood meal, there's fish meal, and there are a lot of fertilizers that are blends of these meals. 
um, that also have the inoculum. You know, this, this is what we need to be adding and using in our landscapes. Um, I've got a picture here of uh, feather meal from down to earth. Um, and, you know, that's a, a great product. So we're looking at uh, 12 or 13 zero zero. Uh, blood meal is usually 14 zero zero, but that's a far cry from, you know, a polymer coated urea that could might be uh, 42 zero zero. Um, biochar. So in Central and Southern America, the indigenous people were uh, practicing this, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago. And even today, the, um, the folks that know where this stuff is are going in and digging it out of the, these old historically uh, ancient sites and using it for agriculture. Uh, and they call it terra preta or black earth. And um, it's essentially a wood that has been partially burned, uh, a process called pyrolysis, which is, you know, fancy for burning it. Um, and, but then it's stopped, it's halted. So they take out the oxygen and, and that material then, if you look at it really close up, you can see the uh, commonalities between biochar and humus. And uh, I like to think of it as a sponge, right? And so when you're using biochar, what you want to do is just like a sponge, you want to charge it. And um, so if, if you're able to put some fish hydrolysate in there, right? Put some... Um, and endomycorrhizae inoculant in there, uh, maybe some kelp extract, uh, you know, humate. So you can put uh, good fertilizers, organic fertilizers and other things um, into biochar and charge it and then add it to compost, add it to your backfill mix, um, integrate it into the top uh, six to eight inches of the soil, um, and, and it can last a long time. It's also uh, huge in terms of sequestering carbon. So it improves the water holding capacity and the uh, microbial activity. If you look at this little chart here, you can see how, you know, plants will take in carbon um, from carbon dioxide and make hydrocarbons. And then usually that decomposes and makes its way, a lot of it back up into the atmosphere. Some of it is gonna be in the soil for a while, but bi biochar is a way to take some of that carbon off and sequester it into the soils um, in a very stable form. There are, you know, anything from just burning and then putting the stuff out to, um, machines that can do it on a larger scale. And there are fancier things now that can actually at the same time while making biochar, take the gases off as a biofuel. So that's really cool. Um, this is a picture here showing how some uh, uh, producers are pelletizing it. So it looks almost like what you'd get to, to put in a, a pellet stove, except it's, it's biochar. And you can add this to a wheelbarrow or bucket, um, fill it with some organic uh, amendments and water and let it soak that up, charge it, and then get that out into the root zone of your plants. Or on a larger scale, what Will was doing is adding it to compost as a special blend. So one of the other things he did was biodynamic preparations. And uh, biodynamic agriculture really started back in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, Rudolf Steiner was the initial proponent of this. And, you know, back in, in those days, they didn't have the science that we have today. And he had some kind of funky ideas of bringing cosmic energy into the soil. Um, but essentially what he was doing was he was taking different manures and different blends of herbs and he was packing them into uh, steer horns or um, animal uh, skins and burying them and then digging them up once they had decomposed and then using that material uh, to almost to inoculate uh, fields or compost 
almost on a homeopathic level. So there's just a little bit there. And it, it was mad. He could see the results. And, you know, he had a different explanation as to what was happening. But today we look back on it and we think, well, of course, he was getting this wide range of soil organisms and then inoculating the compost or the fields with it and then seeing the results. So um, this, this is, is super cool. And what I've learned though, is that the biodynamic associations of today, they are certifying uh, breweries and wineries. And so Will got associated with some of these wineries and made sure that they were using these preps with the compost to enhance um, their nutrient availability, multiplying the microbial diversity, stabilizing that nitrogen. Um, and, and I love this little uh, note here, uh, that biodynamic compost helps attune the soil to the whole farm organism. And that's a neat concept, the farm organism. You know, I think we know now uh, of our, our personal biome that our ourselves, right? We, we're only about a, a tenth <laughs> of, of, of what's really makes us up and that we are ourselves an ecology and yet an organism, right? So there's all these different organisms within us. Uh, so the same concept can be applied to a farm where there's all these organisms working symbiotically um, and that you can think of that farm as an ecology but also an organism and you can expand on this right up to you know the Gaia hypothesis which really says that the whole biosphere of our mother earth is an organism and there are uh, feedback loops and it, it, so Neat idea to think about um, our land and our gardens and our farms as organisms and how using these biodynamic preps, we can enhance the biodiversity of the organisms within the soil. Kind of a neat aside on that. He had a, a neat thing. Um, he, I'm meaning Rudolf Steiner, he created a, um, a mixer to go on the back of a tractor that would stir these um, preps in solution one way and then the other way, one way and then the other way. And in so doing, um, all those, um, it, it stirred it up and it, it stirred it around into these little whirlpools. And at the apex of these whirlpools, some of the uh, elements that were in suspension there would actually uh, take on a positive electrical charge so that he could keep things in suspension and spray that out over the field. But then also, because these um, elements in suspension were charged, they would adhere to the negatively charged clay particles and humus, because you know humus has those uh, negative uh, sites as well, when we talk about cation exchange capacity. So one of the other things that uh, Will was doing is he was working a lot with worm castings. And um, vermiculture is where we take our organic wastes and some manures and, and we can let the worms eat it. And the worms are going to take the nutrients within that feedstock and break it down and enhance it. But then they also have like a little slime layer they add. So it's actually much more um, f nutritious in terms of plant nutrients than the material they're eating. Um, and so it, it's got an NPK of roughly 553. It's almost 100% humus. There's rich microbial colonies within worm castings, uh, much better than compost itself. But as Will knew, you could add it to compost to really boost its effective, effectiveness. And so, um, when added to the soil, worm castings will improve flower size, bloom quantity, quality, and color, fruit and vegetable yield improvements of up to 200%, uh, as well as improved taste and appearance and, and for sure the nutrient content, but also fighting soil-borne plant diseases, repelling insects, and it can be used as a tea. 
Um, while we were at this uh, dinner meeting at the north coast of CLCA, uh, one of the uh, folks there was a purveyor of worm castings, and he actually handed out some samples, which was great. But one of their other products is a, um, a tea that they make. And so this tea is soluble um, to the point that you can actually put it in a fertigation system and put it out through drip irrigation. And it's not going to clog, but it's going to give you all these benefits. So I'll, maybe I'll put the link to their company uh, in here. But really cool to be able to think about putting worm castings into compost. One of the other compost additives is oyster shell flour. So this would be in reaction to um, the pH. If you wanted to make a slight um, adjustment, right, it's going to raise the pH a little bit, make your soils a little more alkali if it's too acidic for the plants that you want to grow. You know, all plants have a preference for the kind of uh, pH or the, the acidity or alkalinity of the soil that they like to grow in. Some of the times that can be to a large degree buffered by organic matter and uh, endomycorrhizal fungi. But, you know, rather than jumping to agricultural lime, which can actually change the pH maybe more dramatically than you want, um, this calcium carbonate in oyster shell uh, is going to do it um, slowly and um, it's almost like a time release because it gets acted on by the uh, organisms in the soil. But there's also, there's about 10% phosphoric acid in here. So it's also a phosphorus supply. Uh, not very much, but, but it's a little bit there. So this can be added to compost. Then we get to mycorrhizae. So endo and ecto mycorrhizae are um, fungi that have a symbiotic relationship with plants and, their, and the roots. And what they do is they will colonize the roots and then send their hyphae out into the soil and greatly expand, like up to a thousand times, the amount of water and nutrients available to those plants. So if you've got two plants and one has um, a strong colonization of mycorrhizae and the other one doesn't, the one that has that symbiotic relationship is going to thrive compared to the other one. So um, the neat thing about this is that the, if you can picture, so here on this slide you can see all these, so this is the end of a root, right? And all these fine materials, those are not root hairs, those are the mycorrhizae of the endomycor um, endomycorrhizal uh, fungi, and they are uh, heading out, but they're, as they bring back nutrients and water to the plant in exchange for carbohydrates and other foods that the plants are putting out as root exudates, they, um, they need to act like a pipe or a tube. And to do that, they have their own exudate uh, that's been called glomalin. And glomalin is a glycoprotein that is extremely high in carbon and is very stable in soil. So that while the roots may not last that long and even the hyphae may not last that long because the roots are always growing and the hyphae is always growing and sloughing off and the older ones are decomposing within the soil um, and getting eaten by the soil food web participants, uh, but, uh, but that glomalin that's produced is stable uh, for a very long time. And that's one of the ways that the plants can take up our atmospheric CO2, um, not only make put, uh, cellulose out of it, but pump it out into uh, the soil and into the mycorrhizae, which then create the glomalin, right? Um, that then is stable for in the soil for a long time. So using this as a way to sequester carbon is going to be huge. And it's a big part of how landscapers and gardeners, by adding organic matter and 
Um, having plants that have this symbiotic relationship are going to uh, really be able to sequester a, a lot of carbon and make a big difference in terms of climate change. So um, it increases plant available phosphorus. That, that's related to the pH issues where, you know, um, in a very low pH situation where it's really acidic, uh, phosphorus is not that available. So like if you take blueberries or huckleberries as an example, right? They live in extremely low pHs and yet, you know, they need a lot of phosphorus. It's one of the biggest macronutrient needs of plants. And they can get that through a symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhizae, whereas the roots may not be able to get it on their own in that low uh, pH environment. It increases the macro aggregate stability. So those are those, those aggregates of the sand, silt, and clay. Um, and, and we know that the more aggregation we have, the larger the soil pore spaces. And when we have greater soil pore spaces, we have faster infiltration rates of water. We have greater water holding capacity. We've got less runoff and erosion. The oxygen gets deeper into the soils, which allows for deeper root zones. It increases the biodiversity and the just mass and number of our uh, soil organisms. And, and it's, you know, on and on and on. And so we want to have soil aggregation um, known as pedogenesis. Um, and of course, this, if, if you don't tell or if you... Um, if you don't disturb the soil too much, it's been shown that you can actually increase the amount of um, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF, to a large degree, where if you're constantly tilling the soil, that can break up those uh, hyphae and it's not as good. Uh, so adding the endomycorrhizae, uh, remember they're... they're, um, they're extract or, or uh, what they what they coat themselves with that glomalin is named after a genus uh, and you can see it here glomus right so here's endomycorrhizae fungi and ectomycorrhizae fungi this is a, a um, just you know a label here from uh, down to earth's biolive so I'm, I really enjoy that the tree and shrub product that they have uh, for landscaping, um, but it's just amazing to see the biodiversity here where we've got one, two, three, four, five, six different uh, species of glomus there. Um, we've got uh, paraglomus, gigaspora, and then ectomycorrhizal fungi. Ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, is, is, you see it more with hardwoods, um, but rhizopogon, uh, what, there's one, two, three, four species of that. Um, Pisolithus, we've got Sclerodoma, um, so, and then Trichoderma, Saccharomyces, and Bacteria, all, the, all these different bacillus. You know, uh, from, in the landscape trade, we hear a lot about BT, or Bacillus thuringiensis, and that is a, a bacteria that's specific it, it kills Lepidoptera larvae, and so it's used a lot for coddling moth and oak leaf moth caterpillar control. Um, there's Bacillus israeliensis that's specific to the, lepid, uh, the uh, mosquito larvae, and you see those in those little mosquito dunks. And so if you have a vector control issue, you can use uh, a Bacillus there. But Bacillus subtilis is one that's in soil um, and there's a couple of different products that we use in the landscape trade that you can inoculate your soil with uh, the uh, Bacillus subtilis and it will actually coat the roots and protect it from uh, fungal pathogens. And it's used a lot in, um, in some golf courses that are trying to use organic fungicides because it sets up um, an immune response within the plant. And it also just, it uses up that niche habitat in the rhizosphere right there in the roots so that uh, some of these 
uh, turf fungal pathogens just don't have a chance when the roots are covered. So, I mean, but here, look, we've got bacillus, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different uh, species of, of bacillus bacteria, plus azobactar, pseudomonas, uh, two of those. But, you know, this is another thing to point out. When you've got this kind of uh, living um, organisms in a fertilizer, right, you got to look at the temperature. So it, they're saying to stay between 40 and 85 degrees and, and use this stuff. Don't let it sit out in the sun and, and um, that sort of thing. So really cool that Will was a proponent of using... Um, these inoculants to help drive increased populations and increased diversity in the soil profile for healthier plants. Uh, it should be said that, you know, build it and they will come, uh, in that if you add compost and, and mulch, you're adding a lot of this. Uh, if you add the worm castings, that can contain hundreds of different species. So. Now, when I say this is uh, diverse, uh, not really, not compared to compost, not compared to what you'd see in a natural soil environment, but some of the landscapes that we work with, you know, it, it's not soil, it's dirt, and it's been compacted, and it's there's really nothing there. So if you have the ability to go in and decompact, add the organic matter, right, and then inoculate it and get a kickstart and then add that three inches of mulch, that's where it's going to make a big difference. So Will also um, was into this, you know, the, the, the soil food web and all of the different organisms that are in the soil. This is a, uh, a soil assay um, that he got from Soil Food Web back in 2009. And he was, I mean, this was a while ago. So again, Pioneer um, submitting his samples to the lab and then getting the results back and comparing the active fungi. All right, all the different protozoa, like the amoebas and the ciliates and the flagellates. So the flagellates were a little single or celled organism with two little flagella and they swim around. The ciliates, they look almost like a little miniature um, sea urchin or something. They've got little spikes everywhere. And, and then of course the amoebas are just these big amorphous blobs. They kind of surround their food sources. Um, but, but here's the cool thing is that things like the nematodes, which are microscopic roundworms, um, they are feeding off of all the, um, and, and the, the ciliates and the, the protozoa, the, or I should say the amoeba, the ciliates and the flagellates are eating the bacteria. And when they eat that bacteria, um, they are releasing ammonium nitrogen right there in the phylosphere where the plants can get it. Uh, and it's just a magical thing. So really cool to see that Will was doing this uh, back in the day. I know I got into it like nine, ten, three years later uh, and started doing some of the same things, um, comparing synthetic uh, management practices to organic uh, by adding uh, compost top dressing, um, using some aerated compost tea, working with some fish hydrolysate, some soluble humates, kelp extracts, and mycorrhizal inoculants, and seeing a big difference, right? So if you look at, for instance, here's the total fungi to bacteria ratio, where it was essentially doubled, right? 100% difference, um, as well as 100% increase in, in total bacteria. So here we've got more food for those protozoa to eat to supply nitrogen sources. Um, and the fungi to bacteria ratio kind of shows you where the soil is. So if you've got dirt on one end and a deep uh, 
soil over here, you can see that the, the dirt, would, the first organisms there would be bacterial and it's going to have a higher pH, whereas the more woodland soils are going to be fungally dominant, have lots of organic matter and be more acidic. And so as we're pushing our soils um, along on that continuum, um, we can see that doubling of that ratio uh, from bacteria to fungi. Also fun to look at the endomycorrhizae fungi colonization, 250% uh, increase, right? So that means that we've got the hyphae working in a symbiotic relationship with those roots of the plants to bring in that extra water and nutrients, and even in cases where the pH might be off. Some of the other fun things I was looking at at the time was that if you get the humates into the soil, um, you can actually have them help buffer the sodium or the salt. So if you're working with reclaimed water or have sodic soils or you know, issues with salts, adding that compost component um, really does buffer the salts, buffers the pH, it's just amazing to see the, the difference. Um, and then when we look at, you know, the WELO, um, the Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance or Rescape Rated Commercial Sites uh, requirements, we can see that, you know, we want to be adding four or in some cases six cubic yards of compost per thousand square feet as well as that three inch layer of mulch to most of the landscapes where appropriate for good plant growth. Obviously, some of our native plants wouldn't want that kind of a attention, but um, for the most part, and especially when you consider the compacted dirt we're dealing with most of the time, this is magical. Um, and it can take your soil organic matter from you know less than 1% up to over 10%, uh, and really three times the amount of ammonium uh, nitrogen source for those plants. So. Um, you know, Will was on this stuff back in the day, again, pioneer. Uh, so here's one of the other fun things he did. He realized that when people uh, were trying to mitigate erosion on construction sites, uh, right, were putting out the straw waddles, which is great, but the straw waddle can only do so much in terms of taking uh, silt out of um, the uh, the water that's coming off of a site. If you add compost to that or create socks out of compost, uh, then all of a sudden, not only are you just taking, you know, the silt out of that water, but you can break down heavy metals. You can um, take out the oils. You can uh, assimilate and break down pollutants. Uh, fertilizers can get grabbed in there so that the water that's leaving that site after it's gone through these waddles that have been inoculated um, is going to be quite a bit cleaner. Um, so using these inoculated straw waddles, compost socks, or compost berms in erosion control was huge. And it's cool to see that uh, Will was doing that sheet mulching. You know, obviously, if you're selling <laughs> uh, compost and mulch, this is great, but, you know, this is really the the low-hanging fruit in landscapes today. If we're going to make a big difference in carbon sequestration, in increasing habitat, uh, and in reducing our water use, we need to transition turf non-recreational turf to climate appropriate plants and get those sprays turned into drip and add that uh, three inch layer of mulch. If we do that, it, I mean, our problems would almost be solved. I, you know, if, if we did that on uh, all, all the lawns that aren't recreational, we would see a, such a dramatic change in, in our uh, carbon issue so this is where we're going, and Will was on top of it, of course, uh, but sheet mulching is really just the idea of putting down a layer of cardboard, compost, and mulch. It's 
biomimicry. So you're looking at that O horizon of natural soils where you've got a natural compost layer, you've got a mulch or a duff layer on top, and then there's this membrane of recycled cardboard that breaks down fairly quickly, but it will compost that turf in place. And it smothers perennial weeds for a season, and it interrupts the annual weed seed cycle. So by doing this, you're really um, knocking out not only turf, but a lot of weeds without the use of herbicides, without taking that green waste. Um, well, I mean, you can't take it to the dump anymore, but I remember the day when that was the thing. You got a big rock box and you filled the dumpster and away it went to the landfill. So uh, sheet mulching is where it's at. And, um, you know, you can see after you've sheet mulched, if you do get the weeds, my gosh, you know, they just come right out of the soil. Um, and you can turn dirt into healthy, fertile, aerated soil without even very much um, tillage or decompaction just by the sheet mulching process. So that is uh, super exciting. And, you know, it's funny going through these slide decks of, of Wills and looking at what he was good. One of his slide decks had this slide on here where he was talking about a, someone's um, a uh, living room compost pile that caught fire and burnt the house down in L.A. <laughs> so just fun, you know, he always had the humor about him. Um, but it, again, you know, the... The gentleman was such a pioneer, and, and I want to just kind of wrap this up with some final words, my takeaways uh, from listening to him and going through his slide decks and seeing what he wanted to communicate. Um, and so, you know, here's some selected uh, little excerpts here. But never leave the soil uncovered, right? If you leave land f f fallow, uh, you're going to have uh, wind erosion, uh, water erosion. The, uh, you're not going to have the soil organisms there. You want to keep the soil planted, right? Keep roots within that soil. Use low or no till. You know, this is really a, a thing for agriculture, but, you know, in, in landscapes, it, it kind of depends. If, if you're really showing up to a site that's been, been mechanically compacted, uh, it's great for roads and sidewalks and, and light poles and whatnot and foundations, uh, but we need to decompact that kind of soil. But once you do, once you've got that decompacted, you've got the compost in there, um, you can step back and, and not go back and have to cultivate again because the organisms are going to do it for you. Make wisely use of compost and mulch. I, I love that. Uh, use mature compost, right? So uh, if, if you can stick your hand into the compost and you got to pull it out because it's too hot, that, that is not mature compost. You want to have compost that has aged to the point where it's not going to burn our, our plants. Um, have a soil test done, right? If, if you don't measure things, you can't uh, manage things. So we want to see where we're at and make some adjustments, add some things, test it again, see where you're at, you know, uh, check, uh, adjust, and, and do it. It's a process. And monitor while you're doing that the soil organic matter or SOM and, and make sure that you're continuing to add that mulch as it decomposes into that lower O horizon and, and gets absorbed into the soil profile. So the two big ones, the takeaways, feed the soil, not the dump, and the diversity and abundance of microbes are indicators of soil health. So that's what we want. We want to really feed the ecology in the soil. The plants will get whatever they want. They have that symbiotic relationship with the organisms and especially the fungi in the soils and they're going to be fine but we need to feed that soil and that soil food web so um, my hat is off and cheers to well uh, I hope you guys got something out of this